Paul, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to be back. You have a nice break? I did. You know, I welcome you back to the show, but I should, you know, me too. Like, we didn't have a show last week. Uh, I even forget why we skipped the recording. I remember I had a good reason at the time, but it escapes me now. Yeah, I, maybe you're getting old. Um, there's no maybe about that. That is definitely happening. <laughs> I'm still alive, therefore that is happening. All right, so I really like the first item in our show notes. Uh, it's you doing some modeling. This will actually tie into a bit to to my stuff that I want to talk about. But tell me about your stuff first. Yeah, I've uh, I do 3D commissioning on the side, so you know 3D modeling and stuff. And uh, it comes in waves. You know, there'll be a month or two without anything, and then I'll get two or three all all at once. And so this week I got two or three all at once, and um, one of them was the Wave Rider from Legends of Tomorrow, I think. And I made a whole video about movie? it, so I'm not going to talk about it too much here. It's is a TV it? show. Okay. Uh, made for TV, some sort of TV serial thing. I, I think it might tie into some other continuity. I, there's a whole wiki, and I was like, okay, I'm not going to dive into this. But uh, this, the, my client asked for a, a model that they could use to make paper craft, and so I made this really low-poly version of the, of the ship. And um, it, it bugged me making it because while I was making it, I could see how the person who 3D modeled it, 3D modeled it in a way that was easy to 3D model. And it's like, well, it's nice for me, but it's also really annoying because it looks like it was 3D modeled, like it was designed <laughs> to be 3D modeled. I think maybe this is a case where being a professional makes you aware of flaws that would be invisible to the layperson. Yeah, it probably does. And yeah. I, I'm sure that that is a major factor, but anyway, I made a long video, well, not long, like 10 minute video talking about all the things I could think of that annoyed me. So you too can become an obnoxious expert. I actually, I got several minutes into the video and then I realized I was supposed to be doing this show. That's why I was late. So <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I was late so to the show because I was watching you. That was fun. Yeah, it anyway, was a fun little I, project. I just want to say quickly, I will have this video in the show notes. I, I really recommend it. I've only gotten like four minutes in, but it's it's really interesting. So I recommend watching it to the listeners. Go ahead. Thanks. And if if uh, you subscribe to my YouTube channel, there will be diecasts every week that we have diecast. And also you'll see the other videos I put up, which are uh, really not that interesting, but you know, they're there. So the other thing I was doing, or one of the other things, uh, was this tiny little commission for a, a guy who's making a game in Unity, and it's just this little character. Um, and he wanted, so, so he wrote me, and he's like, hey, can, can you make this thing for me? I've got like 20 bucks. And it's like, man, I can't even write an email to you for 20 bucks. But he didn't say that. I was like, sure, let's do it. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do, a, do you a solid. And so you made him a hanger. Well, no, this is the this is the Unity and Blender one. It's in between. Uh, oh, oh, oh! I see, I see. I wondered when you started talking. I was like, wait, why does he want a hanger for Unity? And why so did he 3D print it? Yeah, but now I see. There's <laughs> there's handy bullet points there for you, Seamus. If you're getting confused, they're right there, and that's what they're for. <laughs> so. So I made him this little 3D model, and uh, he's like, oh, that's cool. Do you do animation, too? And I'm like, ah, oh, you can't see. I'm doing the, you know, squeezing the bridge of my nose thing. It's like, yes, but you can't afford it because you only have 20 bucks. Like, I've already blown the entire budget just making this little guy for you. It's like, yeah, I can. What do you need, buddy? Like, sure, I'm, I'm here for you. And it's like, I need an <laughs> idle animation for this little character, and it's like this little blob with eyes, right? And so I'm like, okay, fine, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll do it. So I put a little bone in there and like hooked it up to the eyes so that they blink, and it blinks a few times, and it's not good, but it's like, you get what you pay for. So uh, then I was like, right. man, how do I get this into Unity? Like, because normally putting animations from one software into another is a huge nightmare. Like, getting the geometry in is not too bad these days. You can export as an OBJ or as a WRML or you know, there's a lot of formats for moving geometry around, but moving animations around is not super standardized. Right. And I know that 
uh, some people, when they're making games, like to do per frame exports of animation data. So they'll bake it all down to individual vertex positions and, and save it that way. Um, you know, Jonathan Blow does that with his games. Yeah, well, and then there are other people who do it with, um, with like, rigging, right? You have a whole bunch of bones, and then right. you parent the geometry to the bones, and then you've got bone weighting. Um, but then you have to get the bone format exactly correct, because if you don't, then the thing comes in inside out, or the relationships are all wrong, or the animation doesn't oh, have I, the proper orientations. Oh. Yeah, and you've experienced this. Yes, it is a nightmare, because... When it's wrong, let's say something went wrong in the conversion or the, there's a bug in the converter. And let's say it needs to, you know, it's supposed to flip around the X and Z values because some, some coordinate systems use Z up and some use Y up. And those two get flipped around. You will be able to instantly see that something is horribly wrong, but there's, you can't tell what's wrong. Like, if the positions of the vertices were wrong, you'd load it in and instead of being standing on the ground, he'd be lying on his back, your little character, and you're like, oh, I can see what's wrong here. But because of the way... And also, I can fix it really easy. I just rotate it and right. it's done. <laughs> right. But because of the way skeletons form hierarchies, um, the motion, it is not clear what's wrong. You'll just see this person contort into horrible nightmare positions. And it's like, okay, <laughs> yes. is the z-axis flipped? Is you know, it could be just that, just that one small thing, or it could be z and y are both exchanged, and one of them is flipped, negative, you know, or it could be just completely random, you know, it's loading the wrong number in the wrong field, and it's just reading garbage that happens to become an animal. You can't tell. <laughs> There's no visual right. way of telling. Oh, I shudder at the thought of it. I had to write my own converter yeah. at one point, and it was painful. In fact, I had to write my... I've had to do that several times. Yeah, it was... I don't know. So I, I've i never really been confident about doing animations for people unless they want me to do a render. Because if they want me to render it out, fine. I'm giving you like a whole bunch of PNGs, and that's easy um but if you yeah. want to like have the model and have put it in your game oh boy you're like it's you're gonna have a bad time so i was like all right how am i gonna get this to this guy I, i'm not sure about this because unity reads blender files directly you just put yeah, a blend file that's what i found and... out yeah oh i'm sorry i ruined your story no no it's that's like yeah and and apparently, like this is common knowledge in the in the Unity. To, and like I've just never used Unity, so I just have no idea. So I'm I'm dreading this. I'm sweating bullets. Like, oh, how am I going to get into this animation? It's so simple. Like this should be so easy. And I'm like, oh, it is. It is so easy. I'm just here. Here's the file. And and he's like, great, it works. I was like, wow, that was the easiest solution to the most trivial problem that I have ever had. This ties directly into the program I've been doing. So it's hilarious that this came up this week yeah well let's let's move on to that it, it basically the rest of it was just like did some other commissions and and i have trouble getting paid but uh it's fun so i don't mind okay the programming i've been doing is another proc gen level design and this is sort of a lot Ooh. of ideas that i had a, a couple of projects that sort of petered out like, I, I think one of them I wrote about briefly, and another one I wrote about not at all. I just mentioned that it existed. And there's some ideas that I've been cooking in, in the background here. And I couldn't stand it anymore. Now, now is not the time to be programming. I have stuff to do. I should not have done this. But it's like, I really want... These, this has been the last three months of my life. I really want to work on this. Oh, but I've got to get, you know finish my Jedi Fallen Order series and I've got to finish this and I need to do another video and I need to do this I need to finish the content mill and I was like you know the longer you, you need put to help off work on the house yeah that that too I need to move heavy things around the house I need to help Heather get things off of high shelves <laughs> I need to get this lid off a pickle jar for her incidentally that's one of my favorite things 
about being a husband is getting to, oh, here, open this, because you feel so mighty when she hands you that thing that she can't move at all, and you pop it open instantly. It makes you feel like Thor. And like it didn't even break a sweat. Right. It makes me feel so powerful. But, you know, it's not powerful. You're just, you know, you're a healthy person. You should be able to do that. But, you know, I'm larger than my wife, and it makes me feel helpful <laughs> and strong. It, it's it, a it good feeds feeling. The, yeah, it's a wonderful Delusion. It feeds that wonderful delusion that I am mighty. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> One day you're going to get her, a, what is that, a strap wrench, and then it's all going to be over. Oh, she'll divorce me. Don't even tell her those exist. <laughs> oh, no. She'll have no use oh. for me at this point. Like, wait a minute, why am I still feeding you then if these things exist? <laughs> so you know what else feels really good is working on programming when you've been wanting to do it forever. Yeah, so I began working on this program, and a big part of it is about placing objects coherently. You know, let's just say you've got a big empty level. You know where the walls are, and you know where the door is. How do you place furniture in a way that's coherent and doesn't just look like, doesn't like, just look like a where like an IKEA warehouse? <laughs> doesn't look yeah. like it just a a random jumble. Now I've got something. This is the thing I want to be working on, and I'm going to do a write up on it eventually. But nice. But to do this, I needed to do. I needed to have some models to work with, and you can go get free models that are like you know, oh here's an office chair for ten thousand polygons, and it's like. Thing, I don't want to choke on 10,000 polygons every time I import something. I need a 20 polygon chair. You know what I'm talking about? Like just yeah, yeah. something something that is representational of a chair that you can look and see that this at first I, I began this project with the delusion that look, okay, Seamus, look, this won't take the long. You can just use cubes to represent the, you know, big cube for a table, tall cube for a chair, low cube for a bench. It doesn't need to be... Uh, yeah. you know, little... But it doesn't work because you can't tell if you got it right because when you look right. at it, you're like, I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, well, there sure are... It just looks like a room full of crates. You know? It's yeah. like... So, oh, I'm back so in I'm Mass like... Effect. Oh, no! <laughs> so, I've like got a... Alright, well, I'll do a little modeling and I have... Oh, I got over the initial hump with Blender, and I am having a really good time with it. Boy, that <gasps> first... Yeah. Yeah, I really like Blender 2.8. I can't believe how much I viscerally hated this program back in the late aughts. Um, no, it was like the mid-aughts. It was about the time I launched my website. But now I'm a huge fan of Blender. I like it all the It has gotten tools. a lot better. Yeah, it has. And so I've been doing, but I've been doing, you know, minimum effort, you know, minimum number of, these are like, you know, what furniture looked like in video games, you know, 15 years ago, right? Yeah. I guess 20. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I, um, I'm really glad that you're using Blender. I'm kind of sad that you didn't ask me because I would have sent you straight to poly.google.com. It's like a whole oh. bunch of low poly models for free. Oh, wow, really? I wanted to, I thought I could bring this up with Paul. He'd probably have a bunch of advice. And then I thought, he's so busy. He's so busy. I shouldn't do this. This is stupid. I felt like I shouldn't be doing it to begin with. So I felt like I was already wasting my own time. And I would have felt even <laughs> no. more difficult. It, it, or I would have felt even more guilty if I you know, begin wasting your time too. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to dump anybody else's time into this hole, but I, I will look at polygon. But one of the things is I got very picky about pixel density on the textures. Cause I wanted them to match, you know, so ah, one of them is okay. So you're texturing. You know, yes. Well, here's, here's what I got into is I was like, I hate unity's importer. No, I don't hate it. It is 90% of the way to being a brilliant importer. And they stopped at that last 10% and said, screw it, that's close enough. Just like Blender in the mid-aughts. <laughs> right. So, 
So the the thing it does is, like I alluded to earlier, um, Unity is a Y up environment. So you go up, you go positive on the Y axis, and your character is flying into the air. Right. And this isn't. I mean, like. That is how the design, the developers assume you're going to use the language. That's how the physics engine is, engine is tuned. That's how the camera is oriented. That's how all the controls assume you'll be navigating the scene. Like, if you wanted to change that, you would be in for a world of hurt. Don't do that. But And it's probably um, X forward. X would be lateral and Y is forward. If you're sort of in the default position. You're usually looking down the y-axis. Like y would be oh, coming out oh, of no, the wait, screen. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I was talking about Blender. <laughs> it oh, is. No! I, uh, this has been my whole week. Uh, this has been the last couple weeks for me. In both programs, X is lateral, side to side. In Unity, Y is up, and in, and Z is like your north-south axis, in and out of the screen mm -hmm. if you're right. sort of looking right. forward. And in Blender, Y is your north-south axis, and Z is up. Now, I like the Blender... Um, I'll tell you why. In Unity, it, the game can run in 2D. You know, you can make 2D games, like side-scrollers. So sure. the game basically just throws away the, the Z value. Um, and or it does like a 2.5D where you can use Z as depth, but it doesn't really animate it. Right, right, right. But the point is, then the main two variables you're using are X and Y. Y is up and down, and X is side to side. That's great, but it's really annoying. Like I like the coordinate system where when you look, when you get overhead of the model and look straight down, it forms a nice map view, so you can throw away the Z value, and you've essentially got a 2D map of the world you're building. I prefer that. Mm. Anyway, you need to... Uh, Blender doesn't... When Unity imports a Blender model, it imports it correctly, gets all the UV... But this is a big deal. It is a good importer. It gets all the UV values right. It gets the texture seams, the normals, the tangents, everything correct. If you've got multiple objects in the scene, it will keep them as multiple objects. And but, it imports armatures and weighting and animation. It's just like they really did a good job on it. Except they didn't do the full um, coordinate change, which is the easiest step. So when you get the <laughs> So the model gets into Unity, and it's laying on its back, right? Yeah. And then Unity rotates the model forward so that it's upright. But now it's constantly rotated 90 degrees on the x-axis, which that can mess you up really bad. <laughs> like, if you, if you try to use that object like any other object... It's not going to move the way you expect because Does it's Unity already use been local coordinates for all their positions. Um, I I don't remember how it works. I just remember being really irritated with this. And also, I, th there were some other things I wanted to do, like I needed to add some to make this system work. I needed to be able to add some tags, like invisible points in space where I could write, you know, little notes for my program that would get imported into my program. And so mm -hmm. my solution was just create a random object and name it something that I could get to on the Unity side, or on the, yeah, Unity side. And when the model comes in, I look at it and go, oh, oh, it's got this special tag name. I'm not supposed to build this into a 3D model. This is just a note for where this piece of furniture would spawn another piece of furniture, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, that makes sense. So I had to build my own converter. It actually bl brings in the Blender model, and then it does all this work reading tags and doing all kinds of stuff. 
Oh, interesting. The other, the other reason I do it is Unity has notoriously variable loading times. Like, you'll start one Unity game and it starts up right away. Start up another Unity game and it, like, sits there forever and you're like, what is it doing? And from reading the forums, apparently some of its model import code is notoriously, infamously slow. And if you read blend files every time you start up the program, you will choke and die for a long time. I see. So I just save, you know, I get the data exactly how I wanted, translated fully into the local coordinate system, and then I save it as this raw binary file that I can read real, real fast, so that when the program starts up, it's instant. There's like no loading screen. It's got like, boom, you're standing nice. in the level, I just generated it, and it took three seconds. Not even. And that's, is that a feature of Unity? Like it's a Unity format save file or something, or is that something no, you have to do yourself? No, no. No, it's yeah, I had to hand code it, and that was really fussy because every what? time I realized, yeah, I realized, oh, I need another thing. Oh, got to change the file format and reconvert all the files. But it it, it recognizes they're changed and just automatically updates. It's funny, Unity automatically updates when you you know you save a Blender file, when you tab back to Unity, it immediately recognizes the changed file and reloads it. It's pretty cool. So, Except it really it is. apparently takes forever. Right. Well, I mean, forever when you've got hundreds of them. I mean, you know, when you've just got one... When you've got a Blender model that's a park bench, um, it's it's not a big deal. Man, well, that sounds really cool. I'm, I'm looking forward to... Are you going to release the code as well, or are you just going to write about it? I don't know yet. I don't know. I haven't quite... I All of... All of the screwing around I've been doing for the last two weeks is... Oh, it's so easy to get caught up on... <laughs> to get caught up on diversions. You know, I had to build the level building code first, and that took a long time. And then once I got it built, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I wonder if it, what it would look like with, you know, proper lighting. <gasps> wow, that's great. Well, what if I were to just turn on these post-processing effects just to see what they look like? <gasps> Wow, that's amazing. And so it's just been like, oh, what if I did this? What if I did this? And none of this is germane to the problem at hand. It's just me screwing around with all the toys in Unity because it's a giant toy box. Uh, kid in the candy store. Right. So I actually am on the threshold of doing the work that I began the project to do. Um, and I have not yet done it. Well, Sad trombone. <sighs> Yeah, that's, well, you know, you're having fun. That's the important thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it'll turn into a series at some point, so it's not a complete waste. It will eventually feed the blog. I'm looking forward to it. I, hopefully we'll be able to, to all see the uh, source code and play around with it, because that sounds like a lot of fun to, to play with. Yeah. So what do you say we do some mailbags? Yes. You know, I thought this was going to be an all mailbag episode, but then we both got on all this talk about Unity and modeling, and we blew half the show. Oh, I no. blame you. Yeah, it's all my fault. Dear Diecast, Eastshade did an update without any details, so in the course of trying to find the release notes, I stumbled on this post-mortem that the principal developer wrote. It's quite fascinating, and I was delighted to see that they made their investment back, and then some. That makes me super happy. And they're working on a new game. Also interesting is how super tiny their team is for such a gorgeous game. I think 8 to 10 people were listed there. Jennifer Snow. So, um, Soldier Hawk sent in a, a, same, a question about this too, but uh, Jennifer Snow's is the first one that got posted in the document. So thank you, Soldier Hawk and Jennifer Snow. So yeah, eight to ten people on East Shade that can't that can't include voice actors. Like there no, are they, more they must have hired some people to, to do voices. Like there are more voice actors in East Shade than there are in Elder Scrolls Oblivion. Like that <laughs> sounds like a joke, but I'm fairly sure certain that that is true or nearly true. 
There are a lot of voices. Yeah, they, they did a large investment in making that polished. It was, it was a fascinating experience. Yeah. And I am so glad they made... You know, you hear all the horror stories about indies. It's like they make this adorable game and you love it. And then you realize, oh, they... You know, once you add up all their costs, they made $30,000 a year. <laughs> and that's before taxes. And you realize, no, no, that's so unfair. But yeah, they made their yeah. investment back. And that is great. And I really... I mean, I, I picked at East Shade quite a bit. Um, but that is a charming game. Eight mm -hmm. to ten people is considered, see, you know, oh, there's only eight to ten people. But of course, I, you know, like that was triple A size back in, back at the turn of the millennium. <laughs> like yeah, that's ten true. People would, ten people would make a game, ten to twelve. And I think of that as a huge team because I do all my stuff alone. Not all my stuff. Just, you know, Good Robot I teamed stuff. up with. Yeah. yeah. And even that, Good Robot was like, what, five? Yeah. At the and height. Really only three that were like through the whole thing, right? Right. Uh, yeah, I think there were three of us that did, um, you know, that were core. And then a lot of the other people to do sort of side stuff. But yeah. So 8 to 10 sounds gigantic to me. But it's still impressive. Of course. Yeah, like if you look at E-Shade and then you look at something from the turn of the century, uh, this could easily pass as like a, a blockbuster movie. Wait, say that again? Oh, I mean like the level of, of CG, like... You know, look at Toy Story or something, and like this is better than that by far. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It is interesting. We've come a long way. I wonder if that game, that game feels Unity-ish. Is that made in Unity? I think I'm not it gonna... was Unreal, but I don't know. Oh, those poor people. <laughs> I would really recommend against. Uh, using Unreal for an indie team, man. You just save so much time with... But, I mean, you've got to go with what you know. Like, if you're coming from the big budget AAA space and you've decided to go rogue, make your own game, you're going to use Unity, or you're going to use Unreal. i mixing up the names for everything tonight. <laughs> Unity is... is... Unreal is Blender. I can't get the names of any things right. This is terrible. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, I it turns out it was made in Unity, so your intuition was correct. Okay. I should have prefaced this show by saying I'm, I'm cutting out the caffeine, and this was my first day of no coffee. Really? It, yeah. I'm worried about my Congratulations. blood pressure. Congratulations. Taking, the, taking yeah. the plunge. That's that's a tough thing to do. Yeah, I've done it twice before, and then, you know, gets the cold of winter, and I'm like, I want a hot drink. And, oh, well, I could have one cup of coffee. It's it's just one. It won't hurt anything. And then a month later, I'm like, wait, why is the coffee pot empty? I'm the only one drinking it. <laughs> Where's my mug of drugs? I need my mug of drugs. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah, so uh, basically my brains are scrambled eggs, and they will probably continue to be so for the rest of this week. Dear Diecast. I'm currently thinking about disassembling my otherwise fully functional notebook computer in order to find out why the shift keys have stopped working. Have you ever attempted physical repairs on a PC or other piece of consumer electronics? And if so, what made you decide to make the attempt rather than buy a replacement or do without? John. Thank you for the question, John. I have, in fact, uh, replaced laptop keyboards before, and if your laptop supports it, you may be able to just buy a whole keyboard, um, pop open the case, pull the old keyboard out, put the new keyboard in, slap it together, and you'll be done. Uh, so check to see if, if there is a keyboard available for whatever laptop you've got. Um, if not, then things can get very strange because keyboards are one of those things that are made 
to last only as long as people will put up with them, and so they tend to break in irreparable ways. So, uh, to answer the last question first, what made you decide to attempt repair? For me, uh, this was when my kids were all little, and, you know, we didn't have enough computers to go around, but we'd inherited, you know, ancient laptops from other people, and we could not afford to replace these. And so, the two big failures were keyboard failures, like spacebar style, you know, not something you can work around. You can live without your F2 key. You know, you can live without page down. It's annoying, but you can do it. But there's no getting around spacebar. Yeah, you really need that one. So, so there was spacebar, and then the other attempted repairs were having to do with the machine just turning off abruptly. Like, it would definitely not draw from the battery, but so it had to be plugged in all the time. But then even that started getting flaky, so it would just power off randomly. And we'd open it up and see what we could figure out. Of course, help is better on YouTube these days. I don't think there was, there were videos back then. I mean, you know, maybe some 240p video of a guy, you know, doing shaky cam of the inside of his laptop. Like, just... <laughs> yeah. And talking, facing stuff. away. Yeah. But... There was no real help for us, and we didn't know what we were doing. We had one that was just a little bit flaky, and we opened it up and tried to improve it. I forget what was wrong with it. We tried to fix something. Oh, one of the keys was sticking real bad. We opened it up, figured out what the problem was, put it back together, and it never turned on again. Oh, no. Yeah. So I have had terrible... I mean, these were... These were um, laptops being used right around 2005 to 2008. No, wait. This was... A, a Minecraft was a big driver of demand. So this was probably 2009, 2010. But the laptops themselves were probably from, you know, 2005, 2004. Yeah. And they were too expensive to, re to repair. And also was we didn't know what we were doing. Was that around the same time that, that there were still spinning disk hard drives and laptops oh yeah oh they all had uh they all definitely had cd or dvd players that were horrendously noisy but that was the only pl part of the case that was cool enough that you could touch it because <laughs> the bottom would just be volcanic i'm sure they were all killed by heat yeah it's hard to get yeah you got to open them up and get the dust out if you can Right, and it's hard to get kids, you know, we're talking about like seven-year-old kids trying to get them to take thermal concerns seriously. I mean, even if you explain it to them, it's easy for them to forget, set it down on a surface where, it, you know, the heat just builds up and it cooks itself, and it's just un unfortunate. Like, this is not something I, you know, I would rather have had uh, a desktop computer for each of them. Much more durable, much more safe. But that, we just weren't able to do that at the time. And not quite so tempting to put it on your bed and then flop over on top of it or something. Right. Or, or just, yeah, put it on your, take it off your desk. You want to do something, you want to play while you're sitting on your bed. So you just set it on your blanket. <laughs> yeah, not good. <laughs> We yeah. actually got a uh, a little lap fan thing. It's just like a little plastic spacer, basically, with a couple fans, and it plugs into a USB drive. And that thing has been great. Just We just keep it under the laptop all the time, and it doesn't matter what surface you put it on because it's got that spacer there. So that was a that was a great investment. I, I don't know. It was probably like 15 bucks. Um. Yeah, so so John, back to John's question, if if you can buy a replacement part, then it's probably not going to be too hard to to replace. Um, usually, I'll try to fix it. If I, usually, I'll I'll see if there's a replacement part, and if there is one available, then I'll try to fix it first because I know that if I completely can the thing, I can just throw it away and get a new part, and it'll be fine. Uh, if there isn't a replacement part available, usually I'll try to just make do with it as is because 
I don't want to make it worse and then have to like, I don't know, you, you can't you can't recover from that. Now the nice thing about keyboard problems on laptops is that you can just buy a USB keyboard and plug it in and you're good to go. So it's not as convenient, obviously. Um, but as far as that goes, it's not a, a deal breaker. And that's actually what we do with our laptops at home is um, if the kids are going to be playing on it, we just get one of the old trashy keyboards out and plug it in. And there's like, don't touch the computer. Don't touch a laptop. You're not allowed to get near the thing. Here's your garbage keyboard. Here's your garbage mouse. You can interact with those all day long. Yeah, that's actually a really good idea doesn't keep them from spitting on the screen and touching it with their little grubby fingers, but eh, you do what you can. Right. Now I've reached the point where all my kids are old enough to buy their own. They've got jobs. If you want a better la laptop, you know you know where the Amazon link is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as far as other stuff, like I did repair my, uh, my what, Yeti microphone twice, and uh, I do like to take stuff apart. And basically the idea is if you can see how it went wrong, and you have an idea for what might fix it, try it. Like, if it's already broken, you can't really break it any worse than it's already broken. Um, if it's something where you have no idea what's wrong and you just want to try, like, sticking a hot soldering iron in there, maybe don't. That's what you get. You just got to give it the proper motivation. You give it a few jabs with that soldering iron and it'll realize you mean business. Yeah. And... The other thing is having tools, like if you want to do electronics repair, I'm assuming that you have a soldering iron. That's kind of like bare minimum. But uh, they're not even that expensive anymore. If you go on Amazon or Banggood or something, you can get very nice tools for uh, like under 100 bucks. And now obviously you can buy like 10 keyboards for that. So it's it would be an investment if you care about doing that kind of stuff. But uh, outfitting yourself with the proper equipment isn't, expensive anymore uh so if you're if you're interested in doing electronics repair yeah i would the other thing that i do just kind of for fun is when i have an old piece of hardware that doesn't work anymore i'll just take it to bits and see how it works and see what's inside and see what it looks like because a, a lot of times when you're trying to troubleshoot something you want to be able to look at it and, uh, and know is this normal or not and you only kind of really get a sense for that from just looking at you know, piece of hardware all taken apart because the insides are not, it's not something that is an intuitive thing uh, for human beings. It's like looking at a piece of electronics. It's a completely artificial thing. and It's like we're not hardwired for analyzing. Is this normal? Should it look like this? And a lot of times, like one time my, my wife's laptop was having some trouble with the keyboard. It was being really flaky. And so I just opened it up and I noticed that the, the little tiny lock on the strip cable had popped open and so it wasn't seated properly anymore so i just like reseated the little strip cable closed the lock and it was good it was perfect but it, like if you're not used to looking at electronics you won't be able to easily diagnose something like that uh and so yeah if you if you want to get into replacing stuff or, or repairing stuff rather um we'll get some old printers or, or something you know off a craigslist and pull them to bits and see what's inside that is a cool idea. My son has a my son has the soldering iron in the family, but he's never taken uh, an interest in that sort of repair. He's used it before, but to fix um, oh you know he's used it to fix um, screens like monitors. He he Ooh. figured out how to do it, and every time a monitor goes dead, he'll. We hand it to him, and he orders the right capacitors and puts them in, and, you know, he can tell which ones are blown out, and he fixes them. So Isaac actually knows quite a bit more about computer repair than I do. Nice. The other fun thing you can do with a soldering iron is, is you get um, you can repair plastic with it. We're using some, some uh, wire, just like some metal copper wire or whatever. You can, like, melt the copper wire into the plastic and, and repair it that way. It's pretty fun. He's going to regret letting it be known that he knows how to fix this stuff. Because then everybody in the family just comes to you. Hey, my thing is not doing this stuff. Can you just make it all better? Thanks. And it's... <laughs> right. 
Yeah, the kids do to like, me that, that to me too. It's like, hey, Dad, uh, I put this in the bathtub. And I was like, oh, why? Did you have to? <laughs> put this in the bathtub. Yeah, it's it's worse when it's like other adults in the family that are just like, you know, you open up the the case and it's just full of cat hair, <laughs> and you're like, right. Well, well, and, and then there's the uh, the tech problems are the worst, right? Because like your in laws or whatever bring their computer over, and I'm I'm blessed that all my in laws are actually pretty technically savvy, and uh, but I can easily imagine the situation where you're like, uh, what did you do to this thing? It's full of malware, and maybe it's haunted, and needs an exorcism, and it's just uh, nightmare stuff. Here's a funny story, not related to the show notes. My wife takes care of a woman who's in her 90s, and her husband is similarly... This woman has dementia, poor thing. But, it, you know, the husband is sort of like adrift. He, you know, his wife doesn't, like, recognize him or remember his name. Yeah, it's and, tough. Uh, and he, he has this computer, and it just got endless bits of malware on it. I mean, it was just the poisoned, haunted machine. Right. And it was just endless ads for single women in your area want to meet you. And, you know, all these hot young women want to meet you. We, you know, a woman within <laughs> five miles wants to meet you. And she had to explain to this man, who was 90 years old, that this... Is not true. <laughs> Sorry to bring it to you, buddy. I I find it hilarious that you know you've been through life. You know what's you remember in you know the snake oil salesman when you were when you were a middle aged man in the Wild West. <laughs> you yeah. remember back wow. then the snake. You know, it's not like scams are a new thing, but at some point. You see the same old games in a totally new context, and you fall for them again. And that's oh, man. crazy. But anyway, so did they, I thought that was Did fun. they deban the computer, or what, what happened to it? She, she is actually, she has a lot of experience with this. I always, ref if somebody's got a haunted computer filled with malware, I walk in, all right, um, I'm just going to reinstall Windows for you, but oh, but my data. And I'm like, well, this is what I got time to do. Oh, I'll find someone else to do it. Okay. <laughs> so right. nobody, nobody wants, you know, my scorched earth approach to, to, to repairing their computer. But I mean, that's my approach. If I got malware, I would format. Like, I don't, it happened to me once, like, I want to say 12, 13 years ago. It seems and, like it was more recent than that. I seem to remember you wrote a, an article about it, didn't you? Pretty recently. Yeah. Maybe not. Right. I forget. I forget what I did. Yeah, but it was it was a long it feels like it was a long time ago, but I, you know, got it all Yeah, I I remember. It must have been more recent cuz I was using Avast and, and stuff to clean it off. And I got it all clean off and I was like I still don't trust it. I'm not going to trust this machine. Until I format. Right. So I did. But my wife fixes computers for people and she's very patient. And, you know, all the old people in the family click on the wrong link. You know, somebody, some stranger on the internet tries to give them some money <laughs> for no reason. Ah, yeah. And in the process of trying to obtain the money, they get poisoned. And she's willing to fix that. All right, mm. I will. I will take this next one. Dear Diecast, on a recent episode, you were discussing the inherent uniqueness of video games, and wow, this one's too long to read. Okay, I'm going to summarize this. The full text will be in the show notes. Uh, we were talking about video games and how there are some things you can only do with a video game, and so Jolt. Thank you for the question, Jolt. Uh, Jolt proposes, you know, what about covering mental illness? Uh, 
in games. What about systemizing mental illness, basically? And Jolt makes a few suggestions on how that could be done. And have you ever played a game that uses mental illness in a similar fashion? And if so, what were they? Uh, so thank you for the question, Jolt. <clears throat> uh, the two that spring to mind is Sasuna's Sacrifice, which people have told me is all about mental illness. I bought it with this express intention, not because it was like a sale or whatever, but because, hey, I've heard this is really cool. I want to check it out. People who play it really like it. And I just, you know, another game shoved it off the playlist. And so I haven't done that. And another game, it, this is like movie mental illness. This, You know, there's the two things with mental illness. There's real mental illness, which is very fiddly, very different for everybody. Um... And kind of a stressful topic and a very it can sensitive often be topic. Subtle, yeah, it can often have right. subtle effects or subtle causes and inextricably entwined with someone's life. Right, yes. It's a very complex and heady topic, and people are very sensitive. Like, I would not want to cover this in a video game unless it was something I was, because there will be somebody who takes exception to you. You exploiting it, sensationalizing this thing. And it's like, hey, it's a problem that people have. You know? Uh, but no, you're portraying it wrong. You're you're perpetrating stereotypes. And, and you know, no matter what you do, there is always going to be people that and, that... and instead of, hey, this is a cool game, that'll be the story, is people hating on you for trying. Yeah, so, and because it's not I, something that you can portray easily visually, it's harder to defend right. it as like, hey, this is a, an accurate portrayal. Just look at it. Because like, it, the same thing goes for violence, right? Like, oh, you're, you're sensationalizing violence in order to sell your video game. And this isn't how violence really works in real life. You can't take 24 bullets to the chest and just like keep running and like, no, this works this way. And why are you doing that? I, I have all this trauma associated with the violence in my life. It's like, yeah, that all may be true, but when someone looks at it, they can be like, no, that's accurate, that's fair. And with mental illness, it's like, well, how are you going to look at it? How are you going to tell if it's fair or not? It's it's impossible. Yeah. It's about what's going on in some somebody's head. You have to externalize that so the player can be in on it. And that usually involves a huge amount of creative license. Like the Silent yeah. Hill, I love Silent Hill 2. I think it is an accidental classic. They stumbled on this idea that the town of Silent Hill is sort of this force that draws damaged people to it. Like, people that have done evil, and it draws them there so that they can be punished or redeemed or find catharsis or closure or whatever. And it that is just the best idea, to take this, you know... It gives you an excuse for why you constantly have different characters you want to get to know <laughs> and right. why they're so well, why are all these people so damaged? Well, the town brings in damaged people and and that's why they have to go through this ordeal. And you don't have to question, you know, well why, how how does this city work or how does the town work and what are the rules? It's like, you no, know, that's it's not about that. It's about the character and about what they're perceiving. And it was such a brilliant idea, and they never, ever went back to it. And the rest of the series has been like, you have to fight monsters for the Doomsday Cult that the Doomsday Cult created. And it's like, this is such a... It's not a dumb idea. It's just so much dumber than the idea of Silent Hill 2. But that's another it's game. It's already that I think. in the genre. It's already in the series. Oh, man. Right. All right, so you're going to say something about um, that Hollywood kind of mental illness. Right. Hollywood has a has the same problem that video games do. You, if you try and portray mental illness, you have to do it in some sensationalized way. You know, have the person seeing things where they, you know, maybe the person suffers from paranoia and they have a lot of trouble trusting people. Well, how do you convey that? How do you convey that so that the audience can feel it? You want this to be, you want them to be. And so you 
you're going to reach for some visual tools. Oh, everybody looks like a demon. Well, no, I mean, you know, yes, in real life, people don't actually see you as a demon, but they, they're they still terror, you know, this person who's mentally ill might be terrified of you and afraid of you, and this is trying to convey that idea to, to the audience. It's the same thing in Hollywood. They just, like, we can either... We can either take huge artistic license or we have to make this dry clinical thing about medications and therapy. Yeah. And and neither of those is a terribly great idea. One of my favorite things recently, this isn't mental illness, but a similar thing where we always expect that drugs you know, filmmakers try and make drug a drug trip visual. And they show you things and they distort the world in ways that aren't... That's not how drugs work. But they're trying to, you know, show the audience what it's like to have your mind altered. Mm. Uh, the, the, the greatest example being Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Which isn't exactly what a drug trip is like. But it conveys the feeling of a drug trip, right? But then uh, in yeah, once I haven't seen it, but yeah. Um, but then in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, this is partial spoilers for the end of the movie. Brad Pitt's character takes some acid, so he's having an acid freakout. Now, what you would normally expect is the the storyteller would go inside of his head and we'd see kaleidoscopic colors everywhere and everything all wobbly and the you know the room looks like it's melting but instead the camera stays entirely outside his head and we just see him reacting to like he has to feed his dog and so he opens up a can of dog food and pours it you know it comes out of the, it slides out of the can real slow like cheap dog food does and then lands with a thud in the dog's bowl and he's just looking at it for several seconds and he goes whoa <laughs> and we realize you know he's seeing something fantastical but we have no idea what it is and we just walk him watch him walk around his apartment reacting to mundane things as if he was looking as if he was on some sort of cosmic voyage. That yeah, was yeah. fun. He's encountering alien vistas everywhere. Right. But that only works because we have, you know, 50 years of movie drug trips to drop to draw on. We know what's supposed to happen here and we know what the we know what the movie is not showing us and that's really fun. Well, and he's a good actor, so like you yeah. have to have skill and able to sell that. If you just have a bunch of visual effects, you don't have to be a good actor at all. You can just sit there and go, oh, right, and have the visuals sell it. Right. All right. I had an uh... idea for a game that addresses mental illness. Oh, Gree. Gree kind of does that. Yeah, it does. And, you know, a lot of that was too hard for me to parse. Mm. Gree definitely does, but I... And not too hard for me to parse. I can see, okay, this person is depressed, but like, I didn't understand what sort of depress. Like, this didn't tell me anything about depression except that it's depressing. You know, <laughs> like if if I didn't already know that depression existed, I would not have, you know, associated this game. Oh, this is a metaphor for how someone feels. You know, it just like I would just take it literally. Right. So that that yeah. yeah that's that's an that's an example of a game that goes so abstract that it almost loses the connection to the thing it's talking about. Like, why did this character get better? How does this relate to recovery for people who suffer from clinical depression? Is this color supposed to represent medication or time or what are we doing? Yeah. What am I yeah. doing to get better? I don't know. The other one that came to mind was Cultist Simulator, which isn't exactly about mental illness, but does seem to have the same kind of feeling, the same atmosphere of, like, malaise and oppression, I guess. Hmm. Like being gaslit constantly. 
Yeah, yeah, kind of like that. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't played either one myself, so I can't speak directly. But uh, it did remind me of like, oh, this feels like a. It feels like the problems that the the person that you are playing as in Cult of Simulator encounters are not entirely real problems. That they might be internal problems. Not to say that mental illness isn't real, but like mental illness isn't generally external or well it can be that too it's complicated right it is i even have a history of mental illness like um real mental illness i find terrifying uh i've seen i've been with people i've been with two different people that have both had psychotic episodes so i was with them but they were they could talk to me they could see me but they were perceiving the conversation through some horrendous lens that you know they weren't even sure i was me you know or it very it's it's very much dream lo their logic is like dream logic you know you don't question why you mm. do stupid things in dreams you don't question you know somebody enters the dream and you immediately know they're a horrible horrible person and they're here to hurt you even though in the logic of the do how do you know that well you know that because you created them and you're making up the dream but in real life it's the same thing they just sort of like you become a character in whatever's going on in their head and it's mm. very hard to it's very disturbing because you'll talk for several minutes and it'll just feel a little off and then they'll say something and you realize just how far from reality their their thinking is um, I found it very terrifying. Yeah, that's how, um, uh, that's how I feel when I'm discussing politics with people. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I wanted to do more mailbags, and it looks like we've wasted all our time, but uh, let's try and do one more. You take this one. Sveris Wolfurver. Wolfurver. I'm not going to read the rest in German, so I'm just going to... Read it in English. There's a reason I had you do this one. <laughs> uh, okay, so it's a long question. I'm going to read the summary. Um, if you're playing in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, if you're playing the Cessna Flight School, you have to navigate two waypoints. The shortest taking about five minutes, and in real life, five minutes is over very quickly. My commute is six minutes by bike, and it's so short I don't even bother taking my headphones out of my pocket because I'd have to turn off the distraction for such a short time. But in a game, those five minutes feel eternal despite me actually having fun. Why does f time feel so different in games than it does in real life? Colostus Loratus. Yeah, time Holy and space. I, I, I kind of had to take a... I kind of had to take a, a machete to your question there, Coleus Ratus. Thank you for your question. Uh, I'm sorry for chopping it up so much, but uh, that was too much to read. Um... Yeah, so time, the gist of it is time and space are perceived so different. The other example they give is Skyrim feels huge when you're running around, but then you put on a VR headset and the same space feels like, oh, that's a weird hill. It's very steep. Like you, you are able to perceive the space as you would if you were really standing there and you realize, mm. you know, you know, the entirety of the country is only a few miles wide, if that. I don't know. Is, right. is You can walk across you, it in less than an hour. Absolutely. Absolutely. You could No run button. Just walk. And I'm confident you could easily cover the distance in less than an hour. So what? Two or three, mi or two or three miles across, maybe? At best? Right. It, and it's like not big. the smallest countries in the world take like two hours to walk across so it's like it's minuscule in comparison to almost everything in, in real life right but you but you don't immediately that doesn't immediately jump out at you when you're playing the game you're like wow this place feels it feels like a country you've got you know the snowy bits up here it's a little bit greener over here. It's much greener over here, um, east in Riften. You've got the hot springs over here. It all feels like different biomes in the same country, in, you know, different areas of the same country. Well, meanwhile, that's like different yards. 
<laughs> right. Yeah, it's um, like you're walking up someone's driveway and you walk through a whole city. Right. Right. It is kind of funny. I, I think probably, is, I mean, the most obvious one is just that games are simplified versions of real life and so everything gets crushed down. Right. I, an interesting example of this is Microsoft Flight Simulator. The other day I flew from L.A. to San Diego. Now that's... In real life, that's a real short... I, I don't even know how long, but it felt like more than half an hour. But, you know, in the context of a video game where you're used to jumping in a vehicle, driving for three minutes and arriving somewhere, like, uh, you know, a, a trip that takes you the better part of an hour that feels enormous. Like, there's nothing happening. I'm just sitting here, slightly adjusting... My heading every couple minutes. And yeah, right. games do have that weird time and space are both distorted. So when they're both made normal in Microsoft Flight Simulator, it just feels big and, and weird. There's also a lot of stuff that you're doing when you're flying a plane in real life or when you're driving a car in real life or, you know, those kinds of things that are much more involved than the actions that you have to take when you're doing them in a game. And right. so, and there's also no like real peril involved. Like if you're flying your plane in Microsoft flight simulator and that, I don't even know if engine failures are a thing. You probably have to turn them on, but like engine fails or whatever. You're like, eh, whatever. Like why, why would that happen? It, engine failures don't happen unless you want them to. But in real life, you're always thinking about how's the engine feeling? How's the mix doing? Am I low on fuel? Is my heading correct? Is my airspeed good? How is the icing look outside? What's the weather look like? Are there other planes around? Are they approaching me? Is there something wrong with my communications gear? Am I keeping in touch with the control tower? I mean, and there's just like a million things you're doing. The same thing when you're driving, right? Like, how oh, is that pedestrian about to walk out into the street? Or am I going to get too close to this car up here? Is there something blocking the road? Is there... You know, what's the weather doing? Is there stuff blowing into the street? Do I need to turn on my windshield wipers? And there's like a ton of stuff that you're thinking about that in a game it boils down to push and hold W. <laughs> right. So I think probably one of the things is if it's not simplified, like in Microsoft Flight Simulator, you haven't crushed the world down. Um, you have crushed down the kind of things you have to worry about. And so your brain's not occupied in the same way that it would be you know, if you're riding your bike, there's like tons of motor actions you're doing and you're aware of all the stuff around. You're incredibly vulnerable when you're on your bicycle. So you always have to be just completely conscious of your surroundings. But like there's, in a game, it doesn't matter. In real life, you've also got a lot more sensory input. You've got the wind coming over you, the smell of whatever's around you. You know, is is it hot today? Is it humid? Is it cold? Is my bike making my bike my bike making lots of creaking noise? You know, is there something wrong with my bike? Because it's not the same sound loop every day you ride your bike. <laughs> it's right. not this prefab sound loop. Um, how am I feeling? Am I feeling energetic today? Am I feeling a little bit worn down? And I'm taking this this trip slowly. If I get a headwind, if I get a tailwind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I trying to remember all the little potholes in the road so you don't jounce over yeah. on your bike. And uh, yeah. same thing when you're flying an airplane, like, oh, is there turbulence? What's the air feel like? And it's getting hotter or colder, updrafts and downdrafts. And and you can feel all that stuff in, you know, in the seat of your pants. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you can feel the road. You can, but, you know, you ride a, your bike in San Andreas and it just, you know, you the road is just smooth and you just push the button and you ride it. Is it hot today? Is it cold? Is the road rough? No, none of those things. There, there is no weather for you today. <laughs> you're, there right. might be visible weather, but you're not going to experience any of it. You know, go to the construction site and smell wet earth. There's just, mm, yeah, way yeah. less input, way less input for your brain to keep it busy. The other thing I think Colas Radis here nailed the the trick with 
2D screens, like our monitors, is that they enable that collapsing of distance that allows, like, um, I, for, I forget what the big mountain, the big central mountain is called. But, yeah, it looks big in the game. It feels vast, and you don't have stereoscopic vision, and you don't have peripheral vision. And deprived of those two things, you you have trouble perceiving um, scale and depth. And so that can make small places feel huge. It's painted to look like something big, so your brain tells you, well, as far as I can tell, it must be big. It's got snow on the top, none on the bottom. That's what big mountains look like. <gasps> yeah, and, yeah, and they've got atmospheric effects too, probably that make the right. distant objects hazy, and and so your brain's like, oh yeah, that's real far away. <laughs> it's that's an entire football field away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think two D, and then as soon as you get in VR. Your, your normal visual processing abilities come into play and you, the, the illusion just falls apart. Yeah, and not only that, not only stereoscopic vision, but parallax from head motion is incredibly useful in telling the distance of large things. You know, just moving your head back and forth a little bit will give you a huge sense of like, oh, you know, that's relative distance and relative size. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really tricky to play the same... Same tricks, because they don't work anymore. Yeah. So. Oh, the other thing is, like like I mentioned before, I think um, peripheral vision is a huge one. Just having oh, yeah. that. Yeah. Seeing the mountain in context of the things on either side of the mountain <laughs> helps helps tear away the, the illusion that sense of scale that comes from being able to see the stuff beside you. And Even VR really isn't doing that yet very well. Like VR is still kind of, you know, paper tube in front of your eyes kind of thing. You don't get that peripheral vision, but uh, well, we'll get there, I'm can, sure. And eventually yeah. it'll, yeah. It's up to 120 degrees, I think. And that's pretty good. You know, considering you have maybe 90 and every few degrees helps. Uh, but getting all the way up to 180, yeah, that's going to be... W nobody's going to go for that until the technology itself settles and somebody feels the need to disturb it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but having that wide that wide view is... It's, it's a, a really strange thing to be in a game. Well, like Minecraft, for me, was a very strange experience in VR. Uh, because in that one, everything looked way bigger than it did in when I was playing on the computer. Yeah, yeah, I tried that too back when I had my dev kit. And yeah, it did, I was like, what, these blocks are huge! A meter yeah. block is big, who knew? Yeah, it's, it's a weird thing that it looks so small on the screen, and yet when you're there and you're like, it's like, oh, I can crouch down, I'm, I'm crouching down underneath this block, like, I'm... I'm smaller than one of these blocks. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, the funny things that happen in video games. Yeah, video games inevitably... Cr like, video game furniture... To take this back to my project. In video games, furniture has to be way more spaced out. Like, your living room that you at navigate effortlessly every day would be an impossible space for for somebody in you know a, a typical shooter not a vr game but just somebody like go walking around in a shooter you'd be getting caught on little corners everywhere or you'd walk up onto the you'd accidentally walk up onto the coffee table just step up onto it right well that's another right, weird problem is that video games aren't like, when you're walking around, you're doing it on a goal base basis. You're not controlling yourself like a remote control car. And so, like, navigating in video games is this weird thing where, like, I want to go sit down in that chair over across the room. And, like, when you're doing it in real life, you don't even really have to think about it. You're just like, let's sit down and you go and do it. And in the game, or first-person shooter anyway, most of them, 
you're like, okay, how can I navigate this bulky pill through this obstacle course in order to get close enough that I can activate the sit animation? For those of you listening, pill is not hyperbole. Um, that is literally how your character is usually shaped for the purposes of collision. You're shaped like a big capsule. Yes. It, the, the, uh, if you ever are able to play a game in um, collision mode with all the collision boxes, it's, it's a weird thing. It's like, really? That's what I'm... And it's, yeah, that's what you're interacting with, actually. Um, there's some different... Like, sometimes you're a cylinder... You can often tell the difference. If you're a cylinder, that'll be one of those games that lets you, where you can stand on this tiny, like you, where you can exploit the physics in ridiculous ways and stand on a little, like, two centimeter ledge. Like, it's just, it's just a couple of polygons that don't quite line up on the side of this mountain. But, you know, as far as yeah, the collision yeah. Geometry engine. Geometry seems. Right. But, you know, as far as the collision system is, uh, it's like, oh, the bottom of the cylinder is hitting something, can't go down, and so it's a perfect walkway for you. Um, if you're pill-shaped, then the bottom of your body will be below that, and you'll sort of roll off. The, the pill is locked in an upright position. That's the, that's the important part. <laughs> Otherwise, the pill would just fall over as soon as the game started. I've d it's literally happened to me in Unity projects. I didn't know to lock the x-axis in or the y-axis, so it can't turn away, so it can't be non-vertical. Right, right. And it's, you just hit play, and you're like, "All right, everything's cool. Look to the sides. Everything's fine. Try and walk forward, and bonk." instantly fall over and you can't get back up because <laughs> you're uphill. <laughs> oh, that's adorable. Like, whoop, whoops. Yeah, but in those games, you know, the the bottom of the pill is not being supported, and that's the part that needs to be supported. And so your round bottom just slides off the face of the cliff. Uh, it's more accurate, but also much harder for the player to understand when is too close to the edge because they can't see the pill they don't really know where where the point of no return is we are just going to roll off this edge yeah and minecraft has kind of a weird way of doing it because it's got i think it is a cylinder but it's very narrow and then it does um the other thing a pill does for you is you can go up small ledges because it kind of pushes up the edge of the uh, on the bottom of the pill yeah but in Minecraft, it doesn't do that. Instead, it has like an auto jump feature you can turn on, and so it's a yeah, it's a, a strange approach to it. Although it does have some amount, like because the half blocks. Anyway, we're way off topic. All right, I sense we've done a show. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Did we even make it to half? No, we didn't even get half of them done. I'm sorry. Paul talks too much. I don't know. I can't do anything with him, folks. Just please be patient with him. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> if you've got a question you'd like to send into the mail hole, and in the hopes of having it answered someday, the email is diecast at shamesyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody.
say see you later, Paul. No, you said I talked too much.